I'm nervous, even though I know you, buddy. How odd. That's because you can't see me and you can't see the very disappointed or enraged looks that I have on my face. Oh, geez. You're just imagining them. Hello and welcome to the Imelda Marcast. Our guest today is the drummer, percussionist, and cowbell player of Yowie. He is also the sole remaining founding member. Our guest today is Sean the Defenestrator. How are you doing, buddy? Fantastically well, sir. So I don't think I asked you this before, but what is the origin of the name The Defenestrator that you've used as your credit on all the Yowie albums? albums? Yowie was not the first band that I used that uh, moniker on. I was at the time, many, many years ago, um, I guess uh, really into science and skepticism and philosophy of such. The I think the idea came from my general tendency to be somewhat iconoclastic and to um, metaphorically throw out the window uh, assumptions and conventions. Well, being so that other, other people started calling me the defenestrator as a joke, in part, well, really, it first came about, about because I just loved that there is a word for throwing something out of a window. It's just a beautiful word to defenestrate. Um, and then people started saying like, yeah, you, you, that kind of fits you. You do tend to throw a lot of things out the window. And that is metaphorically true still. I'm going to have to edit out the, the skepticism part for the Christian edit of this episode, but I enjoyed hearing it. I appreciate that. I, um, I think uh, Kenneth Copeland is going to be getting a cut of this, and I want to make sure that uh, we don't disappoint him. Praise Jesus. So you started out playing metal, right, before Yowie, far before Yowie? I did. Is, that, is, is metal where your roots are? Is that what caused you to pick up the drums in the first place? Yeah, metal and punk, um, but definitely starting off with metal uh, without any question. Was not like a prog rock guy or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination in my formative years. Who were your favorite bands back in the day? Which day, man? I guess when you started out, <laughs> you're making me be specific and it upsets me. Uh, when you first started playing drums, like, who um, are you looking up to? I definitely at that time, I would say Dave Lombardo, uh, first and foremost. That was like a hearing Rain and Blood album is what made me say, um, I want to one day be able to do something that has that much raw um, aggression and uh, intensity to it. Do you think the other Slayer drummers after they first booted out Lombardo come close to what Dave does? Like Paul Bostoff, for example? That uh, uh, joke question or? <laughs> I'm being serious. Are you being serious? Yeah. Of course not. I mean, come on. No. I mean, it's not even a serious question. <laughs> and and Paul Bostaff and whoever the other fucking dudes were, I hope you're listening to this. Um, I'm not saying I'm as good a drummer as you are because this is all about competition, but come on. There was, as far as I'm concerned, there was no Slayer without Dave Lombardo. Everything else was like a Slayer tribute band, um, and I don't want to hear about it. I don't even acknowledge it. I refuse to even acknowledge it as Slayer. I will make air quotes every time I'm referring to one of those other hilarious albums. Yeah, it's like Tom Carey and Friends. Yeah, yeah, it's a tribute band. I mean, I did see Slayer on that so-called like final tour and I did have fun even though it's like half of the band really. Quote Slayer, end quote, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the artists formerly known as Slayer. Come on, man. Uh, I'm sorry, Daddy. That's right. Did you know that Yowie has a Wikipedia page? I did know that, and it's odd because um, I don't know who's contributing to it. Well, I'm just glad to hear that it's not you. That might I might have to think a little bit differently about you, but I would admire the hustle of trying to get the name out there. <laughs> so I do know research, really, and I kind of know you. So according to Wikipedia, Yowie is an experimental rock band from St. Louis. That's true. Founded in 2000, is that correct? Yeah, yep. The start was you and Jeremiah, right? Yeah, yeah. We had a band that uh, we were trying to do stuff with. Jeremiah didn't play the guitar at all at the time. He played keyboard. Um, and uh, what we were writing just wasn't 
up to our standards, really. So um, I think with the introduction of the person that I think last I heard would like to be referred to as Little Pumpkin, who was the other uh, other kind of founding member of Yowie. I think that person coming into the band was what, uh, like, I, I would count that the transition from like the other stuff we were doing and officially becoming Yowie. Although I don't think we even called ourselves Yowie for a while. I don't think we even had a name for it until after we were playing shows. I think we had joke names at first for a while. Oh, where did some of the joke names? Uh, I again with Mr. Uh, Pastor Copeland's uh, crowd maybe hearing this, you I probably shouldn't say. Okay, well, even if you had said it, I would forgive you because I'm a good Christian boy. I appreciate. So how, it. how did you meet up with Little Pumpkin? How did you first come to know his work? Oh well, that's a fun story. So um, Jeremiah at the time um, was doing. A, he was trying to become a famous hippity hop artist and uh, was making a lot of beats and hanging out at this studio where like, I guess what would happen is rappers would show up and be like, hey, I want to make an album. And then people would be like, I've got all this, you know, music stuff if you want to rap over it. And so Jeremiah made those and he was hanging out at the studio a lot. And uh, I just kept telling him like, you know, if anyone who, I don't know, plays a musical instrument comes by, um, keep an eye out for uh, another band member to, to try to expand this. And one day we were messing around in the in the basement and uh, the guy from the studio called and he was like, hey, you know that weird shit you guys are doing? Um, I don't know if this is like the sort of thing you're looking for, but there's a guy who booked studio time here, but he refused to, to uh, record in the actual studio. He's in the bathroom and he had us set up the mics in the bathroom and he is playing the guitar um, while simultaneously playing the drums with his feet. So he had like a kick drum and then like another pedal set up like for the snare. So he was like singing, playing the guitar and playing the drums with his feet in the bathroom. And they're like, is that what you're looking for? And um, that was, it turned out, yes. Turned out that's, that's what we were looking for. That was not like on our flyers. Our flyers said, you know, you got to have pro gear, pro hair, pro attitude, be ready to tour and like to party. That's what our, our flyer said. We did not have anything about the bathroom, uh, being in the bathroom or using the bathroom or anything on it. But it, it turned out that was uh, the artist to later be known as Little Pumpkin. Did that uh, Little Pumpkin project ever come out? Uh, unclear. Uh, Lil, Lil Pumpkin is uh, notoriously secretive, um, never talked to us about what that was, uh, even upon direct questioning. Wow. Uh, so yeah, like a lot of what I know about Lil Pumpkin um, has come to me indirectly uh, and weirdly um, that I've pieced together over, over the years from other people looking for him or me running into a relative of his one time, very oddly, just stuff like that. Absolutely refused to disclose personal information uh, to the band uh, that he was in for uh, 11 years. Uh, so even basic information like what state do you live in, um, what, like stuff like that, we did not know the answer to. He had a relative talk to you about like, hey, have you seen my cousin or whatever? No, I just like ran into that person oh, okay. uh, out at a bar and was like, hey, don't you play in a band with uh, <laughs> Ellen, Pumpkin. Ellen uh, substitute name for Lil Pumpkin? I was like, yeah, I do. And he's like, yeah, that's my, and he started to talk to me about him. And I, I learned more about Lil Pumpkin that night because I was like, holy shit, I'm buying you a drink. Sit down. I have a series of questions I would like to ask you, starting very, very basically. That happened. There was somebody who set up a show for us in Columbia one time that knew him uh, from years past and had been in a band. He gave me a cassette of one of his old bands. It was really good. Again, this person refused to acknowledge whether or not he was in the band. He's an international man of mystery and will probably continue to be so. What do you think Little Pumpkin's lasting contribution to Yowie is? Well, well first, I think... He forced something that was absolutely necessary to happen, which is for Jeremiah to leave the keyboard behind forever and to switch over to playing a string instrument, which was really necessary. And that became immediately obvious when he came 
came by and was doing a lot of like uh, kind of the string torture stuff that we do, like just really twisting and bending the notes and everything, um, that the keyboard was far too limited of an instrument for us to be able to pull that off. Um, so first off, forcing Jeremiah to learn an entirely new instrument to adapt to some of the things he was doing that we loved um, was crucial. Um, probably the band would have never come anywhere near its sound um, had the keyboard part remained that way. And that was a pretty big ask of Jeremiah to like go switch instruments entirely. Um, so that was that was fantastic. Just I think some of our most uh, some of our most memorable parts were were all him, um, especially off the first album. Uh, he really just um, was a, a powerhouse of composing at times. He did it in a idiosyncratic way, but he he um, he really helped propel us forward. Just like uh, cool ideas for how things were structured at times. I think pushed uh, both Jeremiah and I um, to, to be a little more um, experimental, honestly, in, in every domain, tonally, um, as well as like, you know, rhythmically and structurally. So given that Little Pumpkin's playing is idiosyncratic, was there ever a point where he was doing something that was too, oddly enough, like not appropriate for Yowie? He, he plays something you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to do with that, man. Oh, all the fucking time, <laughs> all the time. And then sometimes, um, which kind of goes against our ethos in a way, sometimes like at a live show, we'd just be like, what in the fuck was that that you were just playing? And he would switch things up sometimes. Um, and it wasn't because he forgot or was being careless. He just uh, made a game time decision. He was gonna take a totally different approach to the part. Now he wasn't free improv jamming. He just uh, played a completely different version of things sometimes. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we a lot of times had to hustle to adapt to what he was doing, sometimes much for the better and sometimes not, honestly. Just sometimes it was just like, well, that was different. Um, and yeah, and there would be times where he'd write something and I would, I would be like, I am like, I am now proposing to that part and I would like to marry it. I love that part. <laughs> Holy shit. This is the new, this is going to be a whole new thing. I love this. Here's this idea. And then three practices later, he'd be like, yeah, I don't like it that much or whatever. I don't like it. I'm going to play it differently. And then what he came up with, I liked one one thousandth as much. And then it would like die off. Ah. So, so yeah, I mean, I think part of the trick of the, of the band has always been that um, kind of constantly having things up for revision and revising them and tweaking them and tweaking them and tweaking them. And uh, he was the most radical at that. He would sometimes just turn on a dime in a way that made it kind of hard to like keep the structure the same. So aside from Jeremiah having to learn a new instrument, what, what would you say is his lasting contribution to Yaoi? Well, I mean, he, he, he took us out of the realm of like, um, I don't know what I would call it. Um, maybe I'll see if I can find a recording of the shit we were doing before he was in the band, if you want to hear it. It's like embarrassing, embarrassingly bad in comparison to what uh, he helped orient us toward. And that would be um, really playing a lot more with other aspects of the music, not just rhythm and um, like overall song structure, for lack of a better term. He really helped us um, push away and start to go into very different approaches to melody. And really, it's stuff that I, I call string torture, you know, like the glisses and bends and dives and uh, attacking the fretboard in various different hard ways um, that gave some of the some of the really odd sonic components to the band. Whereas, like, I was always like, I just played a regular drum set. Like, I didn't have a wacky, you know, I don't know, like, piece of sheet metal and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, wolf whistles and bullshit set up that was, like, odd sounding musically. Um, the, the, the strings were, were the parts that a lot of times um, you could tell a Yaoi song from uh, five seconds uh, because what they were doing with the strings was, was so um, emblematic. At least I think so. I know you're a guitarist. You tell me. I don't know about that shit. I mean, I, I probably should have said this in, in the intro, but I absolutely love the the unique guitar sound of Yowie. And if it wasn't for Yowie, uh, Imelda Marcos would sound like a very different band that I think would be a lot less interesting. So I owe you guys a lot, but I am not going to cut you a check. 
what what would you guys sound like uh, if it weren't for Yowie? You think? Hmm. Carlos Santana. Uh, I bet Carlos Santana. I on guitar. I have been playing like what's that one big hit he had back in the day? I've been like that stuck in my head, so I learned how to play that, and it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I I figured. <laughs> so like Yowie is known for having a clean guitar sound that isn't embellished by pedals. Now, was that decision intentional th from the beginning or was it just like a result of Jeremiah and Little Pumpkin not having pedals to begin with? Uh, it was a result of abject poverty. <laughs> I, I can, well, I can say this. It wasn't like part of our mission and vision statement uh, or anything like that, right? Like Jeremiah did not have a guitar for the first 14 years of being in the band he just like borrowed somebody else's guitar he also did not have an amp that whole time it was just somebody else's amp who had left a from a previous band like a guy who did a lot of coke who left a skip town and left a bass amp in my basement we literally just uh put it all together and we're faking our way through things a lot uh based on extremely limit, limited resources so i i mean i don't know if we had thousands of dollars would we have like uh picked out and curated an awesome pedal board i i don't know we might have but but we we never did so yeah we didn't have any kind of like austere uh set of rules that we put on ourselves about about things like pedal and sound we were just limited by what we had available Shout out to the coked out guy who left the bass amp in the basement. Thanks, dude. I bet he's dead. But yeah, shout out to heaven. He's probably in heaven right now. Did you always have a cowbell in the context of Yahweh? Or was that just that that first make an appearance on synchro mysticism? Yeah. Yeah. So no, I did not always have a cowbell. Although my the first album, I had that chime um, that makes a very um, prominent appearance multiple times during like... Uh, during like sustained like whole note rests and stuff. No, I don't. I don't know what brought the cowbell up. Honestly, I, you know what, Carlos Santana. <laughs> so being no, the, no kidding. This is that's not even real? well. There's those a, earlier records are pretty solid. There's there's part of a there's part of a song uh, part of a, uh, on the song Mysterium Tremendum. There is like a weird cowbell part that has like an extreme odd meter in it. And um, they jokingly referred to that section as Santana's stroke. <laughs> so um, now that I think about it, this whole interview is going to be about Santana from here on out. So what other Santana related questions do you have for me? I'll, I'll have to come back to you about the Santana thing, but being the meticulous musician that you are, I imagine that you didn't just get any random cowbell, that you were at a, I picture you, you went to a drum shop and you were trying out all these different cowbells and hitting it with varying velocities. Is that the case or did you just pick up a cowbell? I just picked up a cowbell. I'm sorry to crush your, um, <sighs> me as meticulous. I am not really particularly meticulous about gear, to be honest with you. I'm meticulous about everything but gear, I guess, when it comes to music, maybe. A you gear, play you it. play barefoot, right? Yeah, I usually do, yep. So when did you learn that playing barefoot was better for you? Uh, I think it is just me being kind of nervous and neurotic. A long time ago, I remember trying to play something at a show, and I had shoes on, and I felt like I couldn't feel... Drums had to be set up in a weird way at a different like kind of angle and the way the pedal was set up, it felt fucking weird. There were things that I was having a really hard time doing and I just took off my shoes so I could feel the nuances of the pedal a little better. And then after that, it was just like, well, I'm never gonna handicap myself again by putting this layer of rubber between my foot and my instrument. I mean, why would you do that? Do you play guitar with mittens? I don't think you do. So you raw dog the kick drum pedal. That's right. <laughs> Going straight in, just like the good Lord intended it. That's right. Amen. Being the sole remaining founding member of Yowie, what do you think is and will be the like the constant through line despite lineup changes? That's uh, something that has been vexing me greatly, right? So with Yowie 3.0, I think we will call it, for lack of a better term, that is the, the, the folks who will be constituting this, this is a constant source of conversation, which is where is the 
like I have essentially had to answer what are the defining non-negotiable constituent parts of Yowie? Because I didn't know sometimes until they were violated that I was like, oh, that's like not a thing. Like, no, we cannot do that. That's like, it's extremely hard because on the one hand, so let's let's say Yowie 2.0, when, when Chris Troll joined the band, I told him very clearly, like he was trying to learn. Yeah, he was basically joining the band to go on tour with us at first. And so he had to learn a good hour, hour and a half worth of material for a European tour. So he spent a lot of time with that. And as he's learning it, he's asking me a lot of questions about like how wedded am I to some of Little Pumpkin's exact approaches or whatever. And what I told him is I don't want him to feel like he's in a Yaoi tribute band, much like the Slayer tribute band that you paid good money to see. Like I want him to find his own voice with these compositions, like within the context of these compositions. And that means we have to alter the compositions to fit his voice. We can do that, right? So, um, and I think that, I think he appreciated that a lot, uh, I believe. And so that's been the, the, the kind of dynamic with the new lineup is um, helping, especially with writing new material, helping them find their own path in, within this band, but without feeling like they are emulating a previous band member's contribution, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So we had to like identify like what still is a Yowie song. So I, I think probably you would agree, even though there was a different lineup on Synchro Mysticism, it still sounds like a Yowie album. Absolutely. Chris Troll does not play like Little Pumpkin in any way, shape or form. They are entirely different players, but uh, we still had like the the same I don't know the same identifiable approach to to writing finding like the the amount of wiggle room we have uh, uh, the degrees of freedom we have within that um, while having two brand new or three or four or how many there's going to be brand new players in the band um, is hard is like really hard because I, I don't want to be like a dictator who says it cannot be that way it must be like this or or whatever. But, but there really are some things where I would start to say, now we're just starting to sound like a prog rock band, or now we're just starting, you know, like, like we have to keep a certain element of the oddity of Yowie in everything. So that's like a daily source of conversation with writing new music. I love that you use the terms, uh, the term degrees of freedom, you nerd. <laughs> Yo, so shout out to all the stats people out there. <laughs> yeah. I lost my train of thought remembering to comment about that. Okay, I got it. <laughs> so is it fair to say that Yowie requires a level of interplay among the instruments that it can't just be two people? So like Yowie by default has to be three or more people? I, I cannot imagine it being uh, just two people, no. Yeah, I mean, the ideas, generally speaking, um, require contrapuntal type of shit um, where there's a lot of like back and forth and switching of roles and uh, shrinking and expanding of what is a measure uh, based on how those things play out that with only two people would start to become absurd. Like it, it would just like, I don't know, it would just suck. It wouldn't be yowie anymore, honestly, even if, and, and I, we did play around with this um, previously, like, okay, well, is there stuff we can do with looper pedals and then we can, you know, and it just, it's just not going to work. It would, I don't think it would really, it would just be a pale uh, comparison, a pale version of Yowie if we had a, a two piece. So with that being said, is Yowie like locked into the three piece format or can we expect more than three people in the future? It's entirely possible that there will be three people or more than three people in a future lineup. The problem that we start to run into, it seems like three is the perfect number because there are a lot of parts where we are dividing up um, parts of a, of a structure and handing them out to players. And when we start to get to four, each player has to, we have to become more and more minimalistic. And I don't want to like become Schneller Tollermeyer or something like that, right? Like I, mm -hmm. I want to, I, I still want everybody to have their own unique contribution. So that has been explored and I'm not sure I can make it work without it really radically changing what a Yowie is. I would have to ask for, for more minimalism from each player, myself included. And that's not your bag because you guys have traditionally been paid by the note, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, we just try to, we're about girth, right? Um, oh, I love girth. Yeah. So like we try to keep the albums to 30 minutes, but they're just really fat, thick 30 minutes. That's what we go for. Mm, very juicy. So across the three full length albums, how would you describe the, the Yowie aesthetic shifting over time? Oh, I would say it's a, actually pretty much a linear progression. Sorry, stats again, uh, but it is. Um, I think the first album was, was raw aggression against um, all musical convention to include purposefully shoving angular parts together in, in very odd ways that were, that were jarring a lot. And then the second album, I think we got more comfortable with the idea of we can do both. We can have some of these things that, have, that are sort of defining, uh, what's the word, elements, I guess, of our, of our music. The weird approach to rhythm, the opposition to common time, the polyrhythms, the playing around with measures and, and everything. Um, and we can have that and also like kind of have it for lack of a better term, like groove, not just feel like you're being assaulted the, the entire time about the head and face. Um, and then by the third album, we had um, we had really kind of, and this was this was partly due to touring and us being shocked that we had people dancing to our music in other countries and stuff. That we had we had started to go, can we take these same elements and make it to where like it has a very natural feeling flow. Um, even though the things that are making it up are like kind of ridiculous. And so, so that's part of what took so long effing around with the third album. And I was like very insistent that there were no like hard stop jerky transitions and things like that, that we had to find all kinds of weird ways to make some of these weirdly different signatures and tempos and things like that more or less flow into one another um, seamlessly. That sounds like a lot of work. So that's not going to happen on the fourth album. Um, I think we had a, a, a progression from um, organized chaos that felt chaotic and, and, and jarring to using the same elements, but with, a, with a, I guess, a, a relatively head-nodding sense of flow that happens most of the time. And, and for the fourth one, I think we've gone off of that linear line altogether and are just going to do... Um, do other stuff. We don't feel like we're part of that progression anymore now. Will new Yowie material stick to the clean guitar sound? Is that a rule that you think is crucial to the Yowie identity? No, nah, it's not a rule. It is not a rule. Nothing is finalized with recording anything. Uh, so I would anticipate um, that a future Yowie album will have some effects on it, although I note that you are assuming that it will be guitars. And perhaps it's got harpsichord with a phaser pedal like on it and shit, bro, because that's cool. That's what the that's what 2021 is about. Harpsichord. Phased harpsichord shit is fucking lit. Well, that's one hell of a tease. <laughs> I mean it could be, I guess, is what I'm saying. I'm not ruling it out. Okay. What do you think has been Chris Troll's lasting contribution to Yowie? Chris Troll's lasting contribution. He's the uh, really tall guy who played guitar in your band. Oh, yeah, he's tall. Yeah, he is. Yeah, so first off, clearly um, tallest Yowie band member to date. Um, like, he's got that trophy on his mantelpiece. <laughs> I'm sure of it right now. I, I think he uh, contributed, I mean, honestly, Synchromysticism was nearly entirely written and arranged by him and me. Um, so that entire album is is like he he owns a huge chunk of that album. Um, so a lot of the stuff that of Jeremiah's parts, Jeremiah didn't live around for a good chunk of what was written, and there were a bunch of other things happening. So we ended up writing a lot of his parts um, and recording them like multi-track here in my basement. Um, so so he, he didn't just write his parts on synchromysticism. He helped you know arrange and write the entire album 
uh, mostly him and me uh, all the way through. So I would say some of our, our breakout hits, um, you know, some of the biggest dance crazes of 2017 uh, were attributable to his direct influence or direct contributions. Yeah. The contribution that he made there can't be understated. Um, the fact that when uh, Lil Pumpkin left the band, he announced he was leaving right before we went into the studio to record Damning with Faint Praise. I don't know if you know or not, but we had uh, we have tried to replace band members for, in this band for probably 50% of the band's time on earth, which is uh, about a decade right now. So the fact that when Lil Pumpkin left and we were like, oh shit, we have never successfully got a new band member in this band. We've tried for I don't know how many goddamn months, you know, straight of our lives. Um, we've never had it. And for him to be able to go, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And then like, pick, just pick up the guitar and then be a self-study and like start learning songs on his own without like having like uh, some kind of weird meth problem or going to jail a lot or being sent to... Um, you know, juvenile hall or having a domineering girlfriend who tells him he can't come to practice or any of the other things that uh, befall band members. Coming in and just having a nasty attitude, all, all the other things that, that uh, are obstacles to people being able to play music. Him just like saying, absolutely, I can do that. And uh, coming in and nailing it, um, like saved the band from non-existence. I would say not just the Synchromysticism album, but the fact that the band is made it past 2011 is probably because he said yes. Um, because the the list of who do we talk to in, in St. Louis um, after Chris Troll was pretty short. He's a real go-getter. Yeah. A consummate professional. Uh, good guy to work with uh, overall. Like, I mean, I, like... I don't. I can't. Uh, can't say enough positive things. Right. Just um, really works on it. Thinks about it. Has great talent, skills, ideas. Shows up on time. Never shows up drunk. Um, works really hard. Like every possible thing that you would want in a band member. I've found over the years that you can either have a really dedicated person who's going to work hard, who is kind of low on the talent part, or vice versa very, very talented person who's like impossible to work with, but having both at the same time, total package. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's a pretty good guy. Yeah. So given that uh, the later yelling material had some groove to it, ha has any fan reported to you that they had made love while listening to Yowie? No, no one has reported that. But then again, I have not been asking for these reports. But since you mentioned it, I probably should. You also play in a band called the R6 Implant. Yeah. So does your process differ? Well, I mean, the, the answer is yes, but I guess for you as a drummer, what differentiates how you approach the drums between bands? Oh, I mean, that's a, man, apples and oranges comparison entirely. Yeah. I, I play drums in a rock band in that band essentially, right? So um, that's just a very different animal than creating these like, completely tortured structures. Um, there's a lot more kind of repetition. Um, you know, a lot of times in that band, like we, the first time I and the bass player got together, we wrote a song the first day. Which is and unheard it, of for Yowie, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it, we've, had, <laughs> we've had songs literally take 14, 15 months um, of constant work. So um, writing a song in a day is like, um, in a way it was like just wonderfully liberating. Like, fuck, that's a pretty good song. And it's done. I don't have to like to like torture, cock and ball torture myself over every little detail of this fucking thing for a year. Like, um, it it's a good song. It's interesting. And uh, it's also finished. Uh, it was just really neat. Yeah. I don't know. Right now we're on hiatus. There's this, uh, I don't know if you heard about it. There's this uh, some kind of virus thing that's happening. It may be a hoax. I've seen some things on the internet. I'm not really sure what to believe, but um, it has caused uh, everybody to stop getting together in rooms. Uh, so we made an album seven or eight years after we stopped playing this band, R6 Implant, and then just released it kind of for fun. And then the question is, are we gonna continue to be a band um, supposedly after this internet 
hoax. I think I'm going to, I'm calling it out. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. I'm pretty sure it's some kind of, um, I think Joe Rogan has a piece on this. If I'm not mistaken, I would recommend everybody check out. Um, but uh, anyway, if there's going to be shows in the future, um, are we going to, are we going to do them is a question we don't have an answer to right now. Fair enough. You know, some people call you the Joe Rogan of math rock. They better. <laughs> so I know that you are not really a fan of improvisation. And I'm, I was curious as to why that is. Were you, were you like diddled by an improviser back in your younger years? I do have large periods of my life that I don't have any memory of, so I cannot rule that out. Uh, there's a lot of blackout type of stuff that happens. Oh boy. Yeah, some of it is clearly drug induced, but some of it not. And so I can't say with specificity that the answer is no or yes to that. Uh, I will say this. I'd, I'd say two things about it. Number one, so I guess the question is in part, do I like doing it versus do I enjoy listening to it? Right? Are those, yes. Are those both there? Okay. So do I like doing it? I hate with burning passion doing it. And part of the reason for that is that, um, to be frank, I'm just not like an awesome drummer. Like I see people who sit down and they just flow naturally and come up with awesome shit. And uh, I could see where that would be a lot of fun. Uh, for me, I get out graph paper and I try to write something out and I think about it and I force myself to play it and then I erase it and then I change it again and I change it again and I change it again and change it again. Um, what I do is the opposite of intuitive, which is, I guess, the thing that you need if you're going to be a good uh, improviser. The second part, honestly, is that um, I think over, you know, over the years, Yowie has played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows, and I would say probably 70 to 80 percent of them have been set up with people doing some form of improvisation. Um, and I would say of those thousands of hours of my life that have been spent sitting listening to people improvise, I have enjoyed approximately three hours of that total. Uh, and a lot of times that's like within a set, like it'll be okay, they fucking improvised for 30 minutes. And there was a piece there for about 90 seconds where they really kind of locked in and were doing something cool. And I sat and waited patiently for that 90 seconds. And then I, I enjoyed it, but um, I don't know, man. It's like, um, it's, like eating, it's like eating chicken wings to me. Uh, just like a not enough meat to trouble ratio for, for enjoying it. Um, so I think part of that is I have endured a lot of people who are very particularly bad at improvising. Um, a lot of people, that's the like punk rock of the art scene now, where it's like, fuck it, man, you don't, you know, you don't have to write shit, just like go in and play your feelings. And so like a lot of people have done that. Uh, they've done it with shitty, stupid pedals and technology where they're, you know, putting dumb things through delay pedals and considering it artsy. And I, I just, I get incredibly bored with it incredibly quickly. Um, so, so part of it might have to do with the form of a form of trauma of having uh, been um, subjugated um, non-consensually to enduring hundreds of hours of improvisational music that I would not otherwise seek out. That's probably what it is. It's probably me working through my own trauma. So uh, please don't send me a bill for this interview. Two counter arguments. One, Wrong. you have to like, <laughs> you have to listen to the notes they're not playing, man. And two, yeah. Derek, Derek Bailey said something to the effect of improvised music has the most ideas in it per cubic meter. So is Derek Bailey wrong? Are you willing to call him out in this public venue? Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am. And, and I, I do want to just acknowledge something. I know that I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people are going to listen to this interview. Million. I know that this makes me a philistine to very many people in the experimental um, music community. I know that it is the received wisdom that improvised music is like its own amazing experience and we should all uh, love it and embrace it. And I've really tried. I, I, can, I can say that um, I, I certainly cannot be uh, 
accused of not having given improv improvised music it's a, a fair shot in my in my world right um and I will also say there are definitely times when I've heard something said, God, I really liked that, or I liked part of that. So it's not like I'm saying, I hate all improvised music. It is anathema. It is uh, an abomination and it must be getting rid of. I guess I would just say a lot of times the line between farting around in the band room um, and um, doing an improvised piece is a line that I find incredibly blurry in practice. Fair enough. So Derek Bailey, I look, I don't know you, bro. <laughs> I don't know you, man. But um, if you sit down and just like mess around with your instrument, um, you know, during the day, is that an improvised performance? Do you have a million more ideas while you're farting around on on your instrument than uh, if you do in a, in a formal setting? Is that true? Is that false? If that's true, then every time everybody sits around without an idea, Idea. They're geniuses of new ideas, and I don't think that's true. I think a lot of people sit down behind their instrument and do really boring, repetitive, not very interesting things. That's fired. Let's go. Lord. Let's go. Me and Derek Bailey got beef now. <laughs> well, you, I mean, you'll have to fight him in heaven, but hopefully he you dead? don't. I, I, I'm pretty sure he is. Ah, uh, man. He's up there with the guy who left that bass amp down in my fucking basement. They're probably <laughs> jamming. Okay. Sorry. Heaven's coming up a lot. Christianity's coming up a lot. Santana's coming up a lot. I did not plan this this way. I blame you. I will accept the blame. Okay. Uh, so on tour, have you played with a fair amount of Tappa Tappa Twinkle Daddy Math Rock bands? No. <laughs> I'm happy to say no. Those of you listening at home, you may or may not know that like a few years ago, I don't like I didn't get the memo, but a few years ago it was decided that, that there is a thing called math rack and that is like emo twinkly shit, twinkly clean guitar tone shit. And like a lot of times exactly sounds like regular emo, but like then they throw like an extra two notes on the end to make it, you know, a slightly odd meter, but it doesn't even feel like it's an odd meter or at worse. It feels like I tacked on two notes onto this so that it would be an odd meter. Like it feels like ham handed and annoyingly uh, on purpose. You are so. shitting on my whole process, man. Come on. <laughs> so the, the great news about um, that memo coming out like at the time that it did is that it sort of like missed <gasps> Yowie, but it came out kind of between tours, I guess, uh, that everyone accepted that definition of this. And so very, very few um of the bands we end up playing with has been the kind of like what's the band that everybody loves is it this uh, american football or this town that's one of them yeah shit like that um very few of them are like that or chan i mean i hear that music i don't hate it like one time yaoi played with um pelican and piglet um and we didn't even know who those bands were and i remember going i really like these guys but that was also before um, 150 other bands tried to sound exactly like them, and then it became its own like repetitive subgenre movement or whatever. So no, like still, I I would rather play with the Twinkly Daddy folks than like some knob twister ironing board dude who's like amplifying his farts through a delay pedal or whatever. Um, like I would way rather people play instruments, even music that I don't like, then sit and, and watch that happen for 45 minutes. That's like, that sounds like a good idea for a, a solo project for me. Pitch shifted looped farts. I, it's already been done. Ah, oh, God damn it. I'm not that creative. So we're about an hour in. So let's get, let's get to the real meat here, buddy. Oh shit. Who is in the new Yowie lineup? You gotta spill the tea. The world okay. wants to know. All right. Well, first, uh, it's uh, going to be a surprise, but on drums is John Bonham. Now, you may think that he is dead along with Eric Bailey and that guy was doing a lot of coke that left the bass amp in my basement. But in fact, uh, he has been alive. There's been some hangups that I think it has to do with the Me Too movement. I'm not sure. <laughs> there, I don't know much about his personal life, but I th I've heard there's some things that did not age well. In terms of uh, in terms of his life, anyway, 
uh, he's ready for the big comeback and he's going to be playing drums on the new album. So I hope, I hope that is going to be received well, even though I know people's political sensitivities are heightened at this, this stage of our, of our civilization. But more seriously. Yeah. More seriously than that. Okay. So I, fair enough that we won't get an answer until the new album drops in the streets. For you, what are the criteria for who gets to be in Yowie? What are you looking for in a Yowian? A Yowian. Um, well, um, obsessive uh, with detail is a good start. Extremely patient is a, a kind of non-negotiable. You have to be willing to take a part, write it, make it pretty good, then disassemble it and take part of it uh, and then tweak it slightly and then put it back and then change it again and then change it again and then change it again. You have to be willing to accept that it is probably not going to be finished pretty easy. So that thing I told you about with when I'm in a rock band and I write a song in a day and it's like awesome. Like most people have a fair amount of that. Like maybe it's not a day, but it's a week or a month or a couple months. Um, and just we don't roll like that. Like we can't. I think people might argue that that is because I'm a difficult person. And I'm not saying I am not a difficult person, but I am saying that is not the whole reason that the songs um, require a lot of like tweaking and modification and changing and rearranging. And you just have to get used to, it's not finished yet probably. Um, it's honestly not finished yet until it is recorded in the studio. So I'm looking for those two things kind of chiefly. You know, I've had people come and try and be in this band and like, it's clear that they really kind of can't count. And I, I didn't realize how much that was like um, a thing that a lot of people, they just, well, it gets, a lot of people just can't do it. They play music, but they play everything in four and they can be like very good musicians, except for the fact that they don't know how to count. Um, and when you are asking them to play something counterintuitive and they have to ignore one thing while kind of counting in their head simultaneously, that is a skill set that's like, um, if you can't do that, you just can't be in the band. And I can't sit around and wait for you to develop that skill over a period of many years while we try to try to write feebly uh, what we're doing, you know? Look, buddy, counting is an elitist construct that should no longer be in place. I'll just say that. It has been a gatekeeper function. That's a good point. Um, only those with the most privilege have been That's able right. to the best schools where they do teach counting. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. I should check my privilege and my, and I actually, <laughs> you can't see me right now, but I am man spreading during this interview and I should stop. I, can, I can't see it, but it, there is a smell that is quite delectable. Yeah. So with synchro mysticism, on average, it took a year to write a song, right? <laughs> Approximately. I, I'd say roughly. Yeah. So some came out a little faster than others. Uh, but I would say on average, yeah, somewhere around there. So with new Yaoi material, is it gonna be around like a similar time frame? Shorter, longer? Uh man, uh the answer to your question uh is is predicated upon a top secret foundation that I cannot reveal. Um, I would say you should probably not expect um, 20 new songs to come out like in the next year. And let's see, the band played their, our, our last show, I think it was gonna be three years ago in like two weeks. So um, there's no new album yet. Um, I don't think you will, by the way, you said earlier, nobody will know who's in it until the album drops. I don't think that's true. Um, in fact, there was even a plan for shows uh, before this supposed Bill Gates 5G thing hit. Uh, but um, before that happened, there was a, uh, there was plans for a show. So what I usually, what I would like to do is not tell anybody what's going to happen and set up a show and then have um, have the people be at the show who are in the band. I'd prefer it to be a show than a recording, honestly. I think those are all of my questions. What's going to happen? Well, and we got two minutes to spare, so... <laughs> You want to uh, improvise, free improvise some ideas? Yeah, some man. Questions. Like, I just want to, like, feel the beat, you know? Yeah. I like music that's, like, 
feels good. You know, man, like, it's not like overthinking, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think underthinking is the way to go. Yeah, it would be consistent with our great society we live in. Underthinkings for 2021. We're going to do it. Is there anything you would like to promote before we end our time? Promote, promote, promote. Uh, I would just ask anyone who gives a shit about this band. Well, first, I would like to thank them for continuing to give a shit about this band. And just ask them to try to be uh, a little patient. Um, there is a tremendous amount of work happening to make new Yaoi jam hit the world whenever the world is uh, ready for culture and stuff other than Zoom meetings and uh, sitting in your sweatpants and shit like that, uh, hopefully, uh, in the near future. Try to be patient with us. I think there are going to be um, a bunch of things happening in the Yahweh world if it if it happens as I am planning it, that will be su legitimately surprising. So I apologize if I'm being enigmatic, uh, but um, I kind of want to, I do want to surprise people with them and I hope that they're going to be like really cool surprises. I just want to ask everybody to like, don't forget about us. Uh, know that we're, uh, we're in the basement uh, working on the shit again and know that it's coming it's not like we're just like chilling and uh you know we, we're just slow and kind of lazy it's just a, a lot of work trying to get new people trained up and uh stay within the lanes of what yeah we're supposed to be final final question yeah what is your wife's favorite yaoi song um it would probably be the one that is referred to as Tallulah uh, we named our Basset Hound after that song. Um, and uh, I don't know what, with podcasts, what you do that's in the visual realm, but I would recommend that you just have a picture of our dog so they can understand what the song's about. I'm trying to superimpose that on like the image. There you go. I'll send it to you. Well, Mr. Defenestrator, thank you so much for chatting Doctor. with me. And Doctor. I look for Doc, that's right, Dr. Mr. Defenestrator, I hope to see you around in person sometime eventually. Yeah, 2022, I think, would be safe to say. Ah, jeez. You, you going to come down south, uh, you think, for any reason? I don't know. Old Dirty South, S-O-U-F. <laughs> well, I mean, if I do, I will let you know. Okay. I'll be on the lookout. We'll get some chicken. All right. Thanks, Daddy. Love you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.